Hello, this is meeting number four of the data recur group, uh, a new closure group where we discuss some parts of the emerging data stack, uh, stack of libraries and tools for working with data, exploring and processing data in closure. And we, we have had a few meetings about closure walk and meander and Clojask and a little bit of tablecloth. And today we'll have more about tablecloth and, uh, in an intro by Ethan Miller, who is one of the people who are involved in developing it. And as we usually do, we'll begin by introducing ourselves, at least those who have uh, the mic uh, available. And uh, here we are, Matt and Ethan and Blaine and Richie and Daniel. And uh, maybe we could begin uh, with Ethan. Would you like to tell a bit about sure. yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Ethan Miller. I, I work um, as a you know, kind of full stack uh, software engineer at a kid's clothing company at the moment. Um, I don't do a whole lot of uh, data science, but it's been kind of an interest and hobby of mine. And one of the ways I've, had, I've been learning about it is by being involved with the side closure community and the closure, emerging closure data science stack and have been involved in trying to help out and contribute to some of the amazing new libraries, uh, tablecloth included. Uh, so um, I kind of come at it from that angle of a uh, software engineer, very much interested in how these libraries are being built and, and learning uh, data science concepts along the way. Um, and lately I've been involved with uh, tablecloth uh, in a project I can explain a little bit more about later um, when it makes more sense, uh, uh, just trying to enhance one part of the API. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's me. Uh, yeah, and, and maybe Blaine, uh, would you tell me right. about I'm Blaine Moores. I'm a uh, social professor of biochemistry at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Oklahoma City, and uh, I'm a, a protein crystallographer, and um, so I've used a lot of Python and uh, a lot of programs that uh, other people have written, <laughs> uh, you know, written in C or, or Fortran even, and um, so I, I became interested in um, closure last fall uh, through a series of workshops that uh, Daniel uh, hosted and um, and and. Uh, over the past year, I've been trying to spin up my uh, skills with Emacs to <laughs> kind of, since that seems to be the preferred platform. Um, but uh, so I'm getting there with Emacs. It's <laughs> are we all <laughs> learning spiral? Uh, in fact, I spent three hours this morning, you know, just uh, fixing warnings um, for my configuration, my user configuration for the system crafters. Uh, uh, E, uh, what's it called? Crafters Emacs um, uh, configuration, which is very nice. I love it, but I, I broke something yesterday. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, yeah. So my my hope is to uh, be able to uh, um, you know, find some aspects of closure that I can adapt to my workflow. And uh, I, as far as I know, I'm not aware of anybody in my field that has picked up closure. It's very, uh, the vast majority of people are just users uh, and are not software engineers. But we, we have maybe at most 100 people involved in writing software. It's mostly uh, uh, Python or C or C++. And uh, but I think um, there, there's a lot uh, that's attractive about Clojure. Yeah. Well, I like to be able to adapt it. What, uh, I'm curious, like what, is it possible to say briefly what you find attractive about that closure for this? Um, well, I think the um, because it's a Lisp language in the Lisp language family, I find that um, the code is uh, compact and extremely powerful. And mm -hmm. uh, so I think the conciseness of and expressiveness of the code is very attractive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the aspect of it running on the JVM, um, I, to me, that's not all that <laughs> big of a deal. I mean, it, uh, I can see the attractiveness in other areas, but uh, um, it, the one big advantage, of course, is like 
cross-platform compatibility. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful, uh, uh, it's great to be able to solve that problem. Um, and and that, that is a, a, a big plus in that regard. But most of uh, the software in my field, uh, very, very little of it's actually written in Java. Um, mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. really no existing libraries that tap into uh, that are uh, designed for, um, uh, are, you know, that are domain specific for my field. Thank you so much. And by the way, to our YouTube listeners, maybe we should say that, yes, a few of us are very much interested in Emacs, which is amazing and brilliant, but there are a few other ways to learn closure. And so please don't assume that is the only one, even though it might be the most fascinating one. And, yeah. Yeah. and, and maybe I'm not sure, Matt and Richie, if you have a mic, you're invited to say something if you wish. And otherwise, no worries. And uh, maybe I'll, oh, Richie. Hello. Hi, uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, hi everybody, I'm Richie, Richie Sai. Uh, I, I'm currently working at the uh, Visa and I use, uh, I mean, uh, our, our group uh, using Clojure. Our, it's a very small group. I'm actually, I'm the only one who's using Clojure uh, in the company. Uh, and our group is the only one, I'm the only one in the group. <laughs> so so put it that way. Uh, and I, I use Clojure for, I think since uh, for about eight years, I think. Um, uh, before before Star Visa, I I was uh, doing PhD. I was using Clojure for my research as well. Um, I use Clojure in um, I think it's a uh, it's in a very unique way that uh, I use it in a, a computational science, uh, specifically image reconstruction, where everybody's. Uh, try to implement their algorithm with C++ with GPU and I came up with way um, that's the, uh, implement the algorithm in a very different way that's actually com very compatible to the GPU currently GPU algorithm um, uh, it's uh, yeah so and I think uh, it's closure for me is uh, uh because it's a Lisp and also in the JVM, so it's a very, um, uh, very. What I said is, it's it's kind of a compromise between uh, Lisp and the and 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 it's very practical compromise. Because you know, personally, I really like the uh, Lisp language. I picked it up when I was a, f a few years back. I mean, many years back when I was doing my masters, and then. Uh, uh, always try to use it in uh, apply it into my work, um, but then closure came along. Uh, initially, I find it uh, kind of annoying because on JVM, but later on, I kind of really uh, loved it because it allowed you access, uh, you know, um, all the uh, Java ecosystem, all the libraries, you know, the different stuff. Um, so it's, it's become very powerful. And also I think uh, Clojure compared with the common list, uh, it does uh, make this expression like, uh, almost like this expression 2.0, it's a little bit uh, more yeah. accessible yeah. Um, than just the parentheses when you introduce bracket and the you know, curly brace. Yeah. It's more like, a, I feel like it's, it's more modern you know, in a way. Now there are other aspects compared with common list is is different, but uh, I would say you know lots of other it's more of a compromise, right? Because you have you know take care of make sure it's compatible with the Java ecosystem. Um, but anyway, so um, so I think uh, yeah, I, I I really enjoy and develop uh, my project with Clojure. Um, I. Um, yeah, I'm moving forward, I think, I mean, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm just looking at the various different uh, uh, tools everybody's, you know, been trying to using, trying to, you know, um, 
uh, expand my my you know uh, different look you know discover different different way of using different libraries or you know, meaning different you know peoples. Yeah, that's basically. Interesting. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, uh, I, I'm Danielle. I'm a statistician mostly, and these days uh, I'm I'm involved in some of the study groups. Uh, maybe I'll use this time to tell about the joint probe group where we study Bayesian statistics. And uh, Blaine here is very much involved there, sometimes teaches us uh, some of the sessions. And uh, that is one of those things which are less visible to the closure community, but where actually a few Crusurians are involved. So please reach out if you are interested. And yeah, and I guess we'll begin the session. And uh, Ethan uh, today will. Uh, teach us a bit about tablecloth. So uh, just quickly, like how much uh, of the people that are here uh, and we're interested in learning about tablecloth, what's your level of familiarity with it? Who, who's used it before? I've been exposed to it, but I have not used it independently to do something. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I've uh, I've I've seen it multiple times. I haven't really uh, used it in my project, but uh, very likely I'll be using it, you know, um, in, in in some stuff as well. Okay, I just wanted to get a certain feel for how because I could you know there are points where I could go a little bit more deeper, go deeply into some of the things that might be, but I'll keep it. I think that this basic intro should be good. Um, yeah, so my plan is, was, as I mentioned, to um, to uh, just kind of talk briefly about um, uh, some of the basic concepts. Um, and there's different ways you could come at this. Um, uh, I sort of focused on some of the primitives in tablecloth. Uh, so I'll just kind of talk through it. And I'm mostly the writing here is, is was a prompt for me. At some point, I'm going to kind of Put this into some sort of lesson or something that might be a example of something we could use for a course so which is why i wrote it out but um uh, um you don't have to like worry about reading stuff um so uh tablecloth uh is a data processing library and it's um uh, written by tomas sule who i just forget i would never get his last name right uh um, but this is his Twitter page. He does all this like really cool generative art stuff. Um, and uh, it so it's it's particularly valuable for in in memory data exploration of tabular two dimensional data. Um, and its basic entities or primitives are which it which it's kind of adding to closure right like are yeah, are the idea of um our data sets and data sets uh since data sets are a uh, sort of tabular structure of columns um the column um and these entities what's kind of interesting about tablecloth is that these these entities these types uh data set the data set and the column are not defined uh, within tablecloth itself. Um, they are defined in this library called TechML dataset. Uh, oh, I meant to make that a link, but I think I can get it. Um, which is a library built by, well, it's in this TechAscent uh, uh, repository, but it, it, I understand it's written by Chris Nuremberg. And it um, it's the thing that provides um, the data set and the column and these types and does all kinds of other stuff, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and itself can be used, you know, as a data processing library on its own. Uh, um, what what tablecloth is doing uh, is providing um, a easier to use and consistent API over on top of uh, TechML data set. Uh, and some other conveniences, um, and that that were inspired uh, by I think you know um, Tomas writes it in the read me you know that he he looked at dplyr tidyr and and data table from R and other libraries I think um, so um, 
it it provides a um, an easier intro into uh, uh, it maybe more also opinionated in, um, a, uh, approach to TechML data set. Um, so uh, here we can look at what a, a you know simple data set looks like. You can create a data set in this way using a map. Um, and uh, then you know if we just to kind of illustrate what I was saying, if we if we look at the class of this data set, we see that it's it's you know it's defined in tech d three data set, which is tech ml data set. Um, and uh, moving on to columns, we can if we look more closely at the data set, we can extract uh, a, one way to extract a column uh, from a from a data set so long as the the column is using a keyword, which we we are here as a as the column name um, in closure of keywords or functions, right? So you can uh, we can extract uh, the the column from the data set the same way we would um you know key a value from a map in basic closure. And if we look here, we see that the column uh, is again defined in TechML dataset, and um, like other data processing libraries, it has a type, uh, and um, uh, in this case, int sixty four. Uh, and so here also uh, I was kind of went back and forth a little bit whether to mention this, but we can go one level deeper in terms of looking into uh, tablecloth and what's what what it's built on top of. So um, columns are actually uh, what's really handling the um, the management of memory and types and all that kind of stuff under the hood is another library called dtype next, uh, which um, uh, is a uh, provides a set of abstractions for managing um, contiguous containers of primitive data types, as it's written here. Uh, and it, essentially what it's doing is uh, it has some basic types. Its core concept is the is the uh, buffer or in particular the reader buffer and um, you know so a, a read only buffer uh, which, uh, has a type and um, is it and is and it's managed in memory in Java, in you know in a contiguous you know in some contiguous memory block in a, the most efficient way possible, uh, or at least that's the goal, right? And it, um, uh, so it's dtype next, so it, it kind of goes tablecloth and then TechML dataset and then the and then the data itself is managed under the under the dtype next where which is what the thing that's really kind of closest to the metal and closest to the Java uh, interface and managing uh, the how this uh, data is stored and, and manipulated in memory in the most efficient way possible across that barrier between Clojure and, and Java. Um, and one of the reasons um, I mentioned, chose to mention it, even though we're kind of getting into some of the implementation details of uh, these libraries is that for the moment um, when you're using tablecloth there are times when you need to to drop down and actually include some of dtype next's um, functions and, and namespaces uh, and we'll see some examples of that I think when we start exploring uh, so it's it's kind of uh, I think helpful to know where it fits in when when given that sometimes it crops up and you you end up using pieces of it, one example is if we want to know the the data type of the elements of let's say a column, um, uh, we would use a uh, a function from dtype next. It shows up as tech v three data type, and um, in this case, we're saying that give me the data type of the elements. So LMY is data type, and it tells us it's an int 64. Of course, you can see that in the readout, but um, this is just an example of cases where you um, functions that sometimes are come in handy. Um, there's a whole other namespace that one uses from dtype next for 
doing different operations uh, that um, um, on, on entire columns that is particularly important. Um, uh, and just to show you the connection concretely uh, between, um, uh, well, tablecloth, right? We started with, we created this data set in tablecloth. We get the column out of it. And then if we look at the data member, here we're accessing like the data member of the type. So this is like a Java, we're kind of going over into Java land a little bit. Um, uh, we see that it's this thing called an array buffer. Uh, and this is the kind of internal um, storage entity for the column. And that array buffer is a date type next uh, type. Um, so that you can sort of see the link there. Um, yeah, uh, I think that was the that's the end of the brief intro, but I wanted to, you know, stop since it's so brief, I wanted to stop and sort of say like, are there other kind of conceptual things that, that would be helpful um, or that we could discuss or based on what I've said so far, um, any questions that have come up, things I could clarify or go into a bit more before we jump over to looking at some data. So um, I see the manual entering of the data. Is there, um, there must be, there are libraries, I'm sure, for like reading in CSV files. Uh, right, yeah, so we'll, yeah. So all of that, um, this is, yeah, I left out kind of a practical, a lot of practical usage stuff, but yes, Tablecloth itself, as well as TechML dataset can read from CSVs and we'll use that in a second um, uh, to, to, to read some of the, the data I wanted to look at. So yeah, it, all that kind of, so the, the, one of the reasons I also didn't go into too much showing stuff like how you load or, you know, is because a lot of that stuff is, is explained really um, nicely in the tablecloth documents, uh, documentation. So you have, you know, basic functionality, data set creation, saving, you know, all this kind of, all the all those kind of questions can be answered. Uh, those practical questions can be answered here uh, and found. You know, you can find the answer really quite easily by this table of contents or searching. Um, uh, so, but yeah, we'll also see how do we do that when we jump into the exploration layer. So Matt has a question in the chat. Um, oh, thank you. He doesn't have audio, um, but I think it's uh, related to like okay, so. With tablecloth, you can go in and, and access a data set and pull out a column and uh, and as you mentioned, right. it's probably do a lot of other things, wonderful things. So his question is about, well, can, I think it would be, well, can you access that data set from like a machine learning um, library? Right, right. Yeah, so this would definitely be something we could go into more in that, you know, we were discussing earlier, having a session about uh, machine learning. Uh, and there's, it, there is um, a connection there uh, between tablecloth and, um, and the, the library uh, by Karsten Baring, uh, which I think is called um, CycloseML. Um, and uh, so when you, um, uh, one of the, we'll see this in a second, but when, when you are manipulating a data set, um, uh, let's see what's an example. Um, you often in tablecloth, the, the whole idea in a way of the API, which we'll see over and over is that most of the functions if not all, expect a data set as the first argument. That's the function signature is kind of, you know, that's what this, this big thing that Tablecloth does is that it, it creates this consistent API that allows you to have a remarkably um, predictable way of, uh, of interacting uh, with your data. 
Um, so I don't know. Uh, well, there's this map columns. Um, you know, this is as you can see in the signature. It's taking the data set as the first entity, and then you know the other things. So this and this is a function that maps over the columns and then produces some um, some uh, results in the new column. And uh, the connection with uh, the you know to answer the question is that the cyclos ml uh, and this, we would need a session to get into this but it has a context uh, a, an, an idea of a um, i think it's called a context map so like as you're processing your data in in a in a machine learning workflow you 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 know have multiple steps and you have like you know you generate some other data along the way that you then need to access for the next step of processing um and that and so it has this idea about what it calls a context map which always has like your original data but can along the way acquire other um other you know artifacts um and so the connection is there's this um there's a i don't know if i can illustrate it here but in tablecloth there's a namespace called pipeline uh, and it contains functions that, um, Oops. Um, so you'll see here these are these are actually the same kind of function the same api functions that you use with table clock when you're inter interacting with the data set but they've been uh, uh, modified uh to um accept um a context object instead of the data set so you can use the cyclage ml and you can pipe um, your data through in the form of this context object, and then, um, uh, you know, apply, you know, the other thing that Cyclage ML is designed for is to like, you know, kind of give you access to different modeling to libraries that are in Java and stuff in Clojure. So you can, you know, apply, you know, run these models and fit them and that kind of stuff along the way. So that's kind of a long-winded answer for something we won't look at, but the, the point I wanted to make is that there's there's um, there's this connection. So to try to like maybe tie up your introduction a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the key idea is that we need to think of data sets as arrays of columns. Um, it's probably better to say maps of columns. Maps. Uh, yeah. Um, I think you can even, let's see, uh, forget how to do this. Well, um, if we just, let's see, if we just like render, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I know, um, maybe we can do, this. Let me just try something. Let's see if this helps to illustrate. Uh, Daniel, you'll know if this is going to work. No, not going to work. Oh, it's already P pre -limited. Um, I was trying to look at the raw. So I think its representation is actually as a map. Um, So um, it does implement all the necessary protocols to be a map, right. to behave like a closure map. So we could uh, write into with another map and mm. have it, I guess, probably. Mm -hmm. Right, there you go. And columns are kind of funny when they're printed, right? So it is, the white yeah. space is confusing. Yeah. Does that help? Is that you? Can you see that illustration there? Then yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, and I guess that you know to, that's why also when the key when you you know since you can keyword into a map, uh, that's why this works, right? Because it the data set implements the protocols for the, for a map. Oh, and in a in a with a map, you know, you can do the same thing. And call it a, yeah. Um. Yeah, does that then answer that question? That was very helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Um, um, yeah, okay, so let's, we can hop over and do a different buffer and like look at some data. Um, let's see. So I kind of, um, what I have, Let's see, let me make sure this loads. Okay. So just um, so you know, uh, since we, I'm, we're not really talking about that in focus here, but what I'm using is, a, and you may have seen it already, is this is a, um, a tool called Clay that uh, Daniel's authored that is, you know, providing a, a way to interact with, to, to visualize uh, um, what's in the buffer. Um, and so that's what I'm um, using here. Uh, and it has this characteristic that when you evaluate a symbol, you can set it up in Emacs such that when you evaluate a single value, you see it you know, reflected in the browser on the other side. Uh, but then I'm using this function Skittle show, which is just a custom function that you, you know, you can add that um, is, is essentially rendering, saving the dot, the buffer and then, and then writing the entire thing. So that whole thing shows up on the other side. So that's um, just so it's clear what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, that's useful just for, uh, you know, in particular, well, looking at data sets in a way that's a bit more comfortable and also um, especially plots, which we'll use a little bit here. And we'll, what I've added is a, another library, which is also very experimental uh, called Viz, Cyclone Viz, which um, is uh, built on top of a library called Hanami that helps uh, create Vega, uh, Vega um, plot specs um, and again is just tried to trying to simplify things um, make things a little easier so the data that we're looking oh I deleted the link but the data we're looking at is let me see if I can see it um, I hope that didn't work oh it's the other way around Apologies. Mm, okay, that didn't work at all. Okay, never mind. I was trying to be fancy, but I'll give up on that. Oh, actually, I think I put it here. Okay, so this is, uh, it's annualized. It's a data set provided by the New York City Department of Finance. It lists um, annualized sales of properties. Um, and what I did was grab a few years of data from Brooklyn and put it together. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought we could just look at it a little bit. <laughs> um, Let's see. So this is the data. And um, to your question, Blaine, um, this is, so before, when I, in the basic intro, I was showing, you know, just this manual entering of data where we had a map and we were just trying to do a data set. And here, I've got a CSV 
in a directory and I'm loading it and it, you know you just provide the path. Uh, similarly, you can provide a URL um, in this in the same way uh, and it'll, it'll load it. Um, so uh, we've loaded the data and we can you know then like a lot of these libraries, it has a way you know ways to sort of take a look at it. Um, so we can call it. Um, so TC here is tablecloth. That's kind of the conventional way of uh, aliasing it, but this is the expression up here that I'm using to to look and to make the library available in our buffer. And um, yeah, so we can take a look at the head to begin with, just to get a sense of it. So it's got this specification of the borough, which is Brooklyn. This data set. Um, I only um, merged in Brooklyn, so there's not going to be any change here. There's the neighborhood, uh, which um, is one of the things that I spent time exploring. There's this building class category. Um, and uh, I looked this up briefly in the um, you know, description of the data. This is something that they've added to, to make, uh, to simplify um, uh, I think there's this other field somewhere. These codes that are, it's the building class at present, which provide much more detailed, um, you know, granular you know, descriptions of what kind of property the thing is. Um, uh, so these are sort of convenient, like one family dwellings, you know, we can look at more what the option, the different ones are, but that's what that is. Uh, tax class, Actually, one it turns out is you know the you know like residential you know homes of various sorts. So that's one that we're interested. In. The other ones are more like commercial. Uh, it's giving the block and the lot. There's that building class address, zip code, residential units, commercial units, total units. Uh, uh, um, it's kind of interesting that this was one family dwelling with two units. Um, square feet, gross square feet, the year built. Um, and then sale price, sale date. And those are interesting, obviously, and some other categories that we could look at. Um, another way to uh, look at this data set is you get general uh, descriptive statistics, uh, you know, an overview, similar functions, I think, in pandas. Uh, so this will give us some, uh, a different look into what we have. So here it's listing the column names and then information about those columns. So we have the data type. Um, this is kind of weird that the sale price is a string. So now we're getting into stuff we can fix and we'll need to fix probably. Um, let's see what else there, sort of a notion of valid or um, validity, uh, uh, I guess related to missing values because some of these columns have a lot of missing values. This is the building class as a final role. I don't know what that is, but it doesn't seem that important. Um, this there there's, seems to be this number two. So there's like some messed up, a couple of messed up rows. It looks like. Uh, um, we get the min mean, although for yeah, for so we're not seeing it for sale price because it's not correctly typed. Uh, standard deviation, skew. So, you know, um, it's giving you this big overview. It's a very useful function when you're beginning your exploration. Um, um, so, yeah, we can try to start cleaning this a little bit. So one thing I do is, or I've been starting to do lately is I'll have like a, I'll like have like a clean function and I just, and this is a little bit different than it, it well, I don't know. Yeah, it, 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 it's more obvious uh, to do things this way, I think, in um, closure, uh, kind of pack 
operations and the functions that you can use later. Um, um, so, and you know, you can kind of go up and down and, and fix it. But so like one thing we need, we know we need to do, deal with is that this sale price is of type string. Um, now, if we look at, uh, we look, let's look at the sale price. Um, we can do, let's do, do it like this. We'll use a pipe just to show it. So sale price and uh, let's take like, let's, I don't know if this will work. Uh, well, let's just print it all. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, okay. So that's another thing we can fix too. So I just tried to use a keyword to look at the, to grab that column. But if we look at the column names, they're not keywords uh, right now. Uh, and so we can, I fix that pretty quickly by reloading our data set um, and providing a little option here called key function. And then, and so this will, it's, you know, going to adjust the columns in some way. And we, in this case, it, we probably just need to use the keyword function from closure to uh, transform those column names into string into keywords. So we'll do that and then take a look again. Yeah, so now they're, now they're keywords and that is just convenient because we can do that. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so we can see why. It, yeah, Blaine, what's up? I've got a naive question. Um, sure, on, on yeah. Close your beginner question. So you you have these uh, right pointing arrows. Uh, yes, know, okay. Mm -hmm. What does that map to? or? Uh, how are you generating those? What, what do they do? <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good question. That is like my, I, I have to say for me, uh, that's like maybe my favorite thing about closure. <laughs> and it's weird because it's one, you know, it's one thing, but you know, I mean, in Lisps, right, you have this, I think it was the thing that made it accessible to me uh, uh, because I, despite, I, I do find the, the, um, parentheses structure uh, when you have like nest a complex process you know with lots of nested things can be very difficult to read uh, and and so the pipe this is just a pipe uh, macro that unfolds that allows you to express a nested uh, expression um, in a way that's easier to read so uh, let's see we can um, uh, we'll you know have other examples of this, but let's see. What did I want to do? Let's see. Uh, I, want, I think I was going to do. I can't remember the signature of this. Well, that's yeah. We can use a different variation of this. We'll use the double one. This I'll just explain the difference in a second. Let me see if this works. Yeah. Okay. So what we're doing here is taking the data set, getting the sale price column. Remember, keywords are functions and closure, and then taking the first ten values. Um. Now, just to show you what that pipe, that function is doing, uh, I'll just, we can uh, use this macro expand because it's just a macro enclosure. So, uh, oops. Um, wait, I think this will work. Yeah. So it's just uh, it just packs the it just unfolds that you know it's a way to unfold those nested parentheses. Um, and you know you can these pipes can get really long, uh, and but they can still be really easier to read um, because and it just you know so that's all that is and and the difference between the single arrow and the double arrow is just um, either with the single arrow it's piping the val the you know the value the first value into the first argument position of all succeed preceding uh, succeeding functions. Um, and if you use the double arrow, it puts it in the last position. So here I switched to the double arrow because take 10 expected the collection in the last position. It's, it's you know, and, and so this, this is an important uh, question actually for tablecloth. And because I, I would say that the maybe biggest idea in tablecloth away in this very simple thing is it's just saying, these functions will always expect the data set as the first argument. And so th that means right away that um, that the uh, the API 
is always, you know, can always be used with that single arrow pipe. So you just pipe a data set through a series of tablecloth functions to do your data processing transformations. And that's incredibly powerful because it makes the code readable, even when you have a lot of cleaning steps and transformation steps and things like that going on. Does that help? Uh, yes, it does. It helps a lot. So yeah. I, I remember uh, reading about uh, thread macro, threading macros in yeah, that's the middle of the introductory books to closure, but I haven't used used them in practice much. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, they're they're great and really important to tablecloth. And then there's sometimes when I I don't use them, uh, or I don't know, it's a it's sort of a funny stylistic thing, like. Uh, when they when they look good and when they don't. Um, so okay, uh, yeah, we were going to try to fix that column uh, that is incorrectly typed. So let's see, we can try. Um, there's a function called convert types in close in uh, tablecloth, and we can actually jump over here and look at it in the docs. I think. I'm going to do a search to show you this part usually. Yeah. So type conversion, we ended up here in type conversion. And this function convert types, it allows you to uh, uh, specify the, it looks like the column and then the new type. So um, you get these types are defined in D type next. Right, and they used all the way up here, and then and that's what we're specifying. Uh, we're using to specify the type, and uh, so let's try that and see if it works. Uh, we want to change the sale price column to be int sixty four, and so we'll save. The, oh, thought oh, I did the wrong definition for the function. There. So I'm defining a function here, which we then can use. Um, so we'll say dev clean data set and uh, clean, uh, data set. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Failed to parse the value. So it's not able, uh, to convert. It doesn't know how to convert, um, the values seeing from, uh, from string to N64. Um, so it looks like we might need to remove, um, uh, those, those, um, like the, the commas, because that's what, that's why the, 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 when, when you load a data set, right, it scans it, um, go back to the, right. And it, it, it's scanning and trying to guess the data type. And my guess is that that's what happened is that those commas that were in the values that we saw were, um, we're tricking it for whatever reason. Um, so let's try to remove those. So we'll do, um, let's see. Uh, um, uh, what do we do? We'll do like a, there's a function called update columns. And it takes, among other, let's see, we can look again at the thing. Update columns, just to, I just want, I'm stressing this documentation because it's very good. Um, and you can, uh, well, actually, I'll just go to functionality. Let's see, I'll show another way of finding there. There's columns here and update. So um, is there anything blocking? I'm sorry, I'm trying to move the, the screen around a little bit, but is there anything blocking the, can you see the page clearly? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so update columns, it takes, uh, uh, the data set in the first position, of course, and then some sort of, um, let's see here, uh, a columns selector, which is either a sequence, uh, oh, um, column selector and function or sequence of functions. So something that selects the column you're interested in, and then a map where keys are column names and values are the function, uh, and the vowels are the function. Uh, so in this case, it's taking the data set and then it's saying, I want all of the columns. So that's some kind of column selector. And then it's just reversing each one. 
the function reverses the you know the the column so it's the function is operating on the whole column it looks like um yeah it looks like here we're selecting numerical columns and then applying uh two different an, a sequence of transformations so a decrement and then an increment <laughs> um uh yeah and then here this is the one i think we'll use it's a it's take it takes a map that specifies the column and then what function to apply so we will um uh we will do an update columns on sale price and the function we'll use um i think we can do uh partial so this is going to be we're going to say we're going to only provide some of the arguments for a regular map expression um I see your face plane. We can explain uh, later. Uh, uh, and, and, and then uh, we're going to do a replace. That, so our map, our map function is going to be replace. Um, and the value, oops, the value that we're interested in. And then we're going to replace all the commas. So that's a regular expression matching the commas with nothing. Um, so uh, what we're doing here is, um, uh, if this works, is uh, just getting a, uh, we're, we're running map function essentially, but we're saying we're not going to provide the actual um, data right now. We're going to leave out the last argument. That's why it's partial. And what we what we'll get is I think I can even evaluate this outside of this expression just to, so you can see um, we'll get a function and once this function receives that last argument it will execute. So essentially what we're doing is we're giving uh, we're giving this function just like you know he was using reverse in the documentation over here we giving a function just a little bit more complicated expression that will hopefully remove those commas. So let's uh, let's just check, whoops, um, first if that happens. So we'll do this and then that far clean data set. Okay. Oh, I am using a, I, I, it's, it's complaining because I didn't know what S is right here. And that's because, uh, I guess it's because if this, I thought I, thought I loaded the library. Let's see, let's try again. I'm loading a library that has that replace function. Um, let's see if that helps. No. S is null. I'm doing it wrong. Not sure why that would. Oh, wait. What is it saying? It's saying cannot invoke two string because S. Oh, oh. I think that actually what's saying is it's getting a null value. So we may need to do something else before we do that. Um, I think it's getting some missing values. Uh, so let's try to remember when we looked here uh, at our info, the um, there were these two in the sale price, there were some missing values. So let's just try to drop, uh, whoops, sorry, <laughs> to drop um, to drop those and see if that helps. Uh, so before we do our replace expression, we will um, do, there's a drop missing function um, and we can specify the column so you can actually run this on the whole data set, but because we have so many missing values and all these columns, we would lose a whole lot because I think it would drop everything from any, you know, like any row that has a missing value in it in any column. So instead we'll specify just sale price. And let's see if that helped. Yeah, so that worked. Um, so now, if we look at 
CC info in our clean data set, hopefully we will see that it will have scanned. Uh, oh, so yeah, we haven't converted the type yet, but hopefully we'll see a difference in the values. Yeah, so here we, for example, the first value is 130, but we are missing, you know, it doesn't have our. Um, uh, oh, wait, uh, Blaine, did that um, make sense? My explanation of the partial thing? It did, yes. Yeah. You know, I actually think, now that I think about it, I'm wondering if there's another, just this is just a closure point. I'm actually, I think that this may, I'm wondering if we could do it even without partial. Let's try. Because I think the map function returns a function if you don't give all the arguments. Yeah. So we don't even need that partial thing. You just leave off the last argument and map will return a function. Um, uh, the partial, I guess, makes it very explicit what we're doing if you don't know that about map. But <laughs> um, okay, so okay, so now we'll try to convert that type. Now we can see if it scanned it right. Oh, let's see. Um, sale price. Now it's saying it's an object, which is a little strange. I'm not sure why that is. Oh, because our map that was maybe not worth because I think it might reduce it to produce a transducer. So let me try this. Try again. There we go. Okay. Yeah, the problem was that actually I think the when you don't include the last argument in map, it's pretty it's producing a certain kind of function. Uh that is not what we were looking for. Uh, so we do need that partial uh, question. Um, okay, so now we have uh, our um, sale price at least, and we can look a bit more into, um, you know, one thing we could do is we can just kind of, we have maybe more meaningful um, information about the, uh, uh well actually yeah about the let me just render this a little bit more simply um if we do clean ds tc info and then we'll just select a column this will be an example of how you can select a row sorry select a row uh a very simple one just so it's easier to read <laughs> uh select rows we'll select a row and we're gonna here's our select function we're gonna say give me the row uh that it is just has the value sale price um, in um, in the column name field. So I'm just selecting a. This is this the result of TC info is just another data set where the you know where these are the column names. So I'm just interacting with the data set that is re returned from this function TC info, um, and I'm selecting only this row right here. Just so it's easy to read, and it's a good way to show uh, one, another table, a powerful tablecloth function. Um, yeah. Okay. So, oh, and yeah, we can, um, you know, just do a, just to show you this. Since is a little more uh, complicated expression, we can you can see. So, like, if we wrote it out, it would look like that, uh, Blaine, and that's why the thread macro is so nice. <laughs> uh, um, this is just much more readable. Uh, okay, so we look at this, we can see there's, uh, what's a little weird here is the, there's a minimum value of zero. I don't know, maybe some properties are going for zero dollars in, uh, in, in Brooklyn. I, 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 maybe the houses were inherited. The houses were inherited, yeah, it's something like that. Although I thought like then you need, needs to at least go for a dollar or something. Um, yeah, and then this, I don't even know how what how big this number is. Uh, that's the mean, but I was kind of wanted to look at the max. The mean is obviously giant. Uh, what is this? This is, I'm not very good at interpreting these, but we can just do it over here. This is, uh, two, what is this? 200, <laughs> whoops. Okay, that is 52 billion, 56 million, 800,000. So some property went for 2 billion. I actually kind of disappointed. I thought it would be like a higher number. 
Um, uh, but yeah, it's impressive, I guess. Um, but okay, so th yeah, this is one way to look into that. Um, another thing we can do is, and here we'll use, uh, is this a tech amount? I think we'll use a, uh, a tech amount. Oh, maybe it's in, let me see if it's in table plot percentiles. No, uh, there might be, I might not know the name of it. Um, Let's try tech ML data or tech D3. So now we'll use a so sometimes still we need to drop down to these other libraries and use um oh wait, let me use data. Okay, yeah. So here's an example um where currently uh and, and this may change. Some of the work I've been doing in this in the table clock might make this less common. Uh, but we some of these functions that we use when we want to process information uh, in the data set, you know, do common statistical transformations, for example, uh, are start those operations, those functions are in like deeper down in the stack. And in this case, and, and primarily in tech data type or D type next. Um, so, so here, uh, um, we're going to look at the, we want to look at just like the percentiles. Um, I can't remember what you call that in statistics, like when you, you know, the, there's some other name for it, but, um, in that, in this case, we need, what's that? Like a quartiles. Yeah, the quartiles. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and maybe there is some reference. See if there's a, no, it's not. I thought there might be, uh. So we can. Uh, By the way, uh, Ethan, we yeah. have 13 minutes to the official time. And as always, some people may wish to stay later. Uh, yes. Just to have in mind. This is great, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we, after this, we can stop, maybe think about uh, what we'd want to do with the re rest of the time. Like we can like, do a plot or something like that. Um, so clean data. So we're going to take the clean data set and then we can get the sale price. And then we'll do. So now we have a column, right? It's a call, it's our sale price column and it's in 64 and we're going to run an operation on it from D type next. And we will run this operation. Statistics percentiles, and then we'll say 25, 50, 75, 90, maybe. Um, those are the percentiles that we are interested in and it didn't work. Oh, did we not get our clean data? That's weird. Um, oops. Let's see what might have happened. Just make sure. Yeah, it's in 64. Let me try. This worked for me before, so let me try that. Huh. Out of bounds quantile value. But it looks like that's a um, one of our weird values. Let's see. Or maybe not, maybe that's not what it's saying because it, maybe it's actually expressing the number that way. Uh, by the way, Mark is commenting that ah. there is a quartiles function. Oh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in table clock? I'm not sure where maybe in the yeah. type next. Yeah, I thought I remembered one too, but I'm not sure. Or maybe he means in uh in uh in, oops. Yeah, in the statistics name. In the statistics, Mark yeah. is explaining. Yeah. 
Okay. Oh, yeah. Let's try that and see if that works better. And what's it expecting? So just the item. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. That worked. Who knows why the other one's messed up? Um, okay. So, yeah. What are these again? This would be like, what are the quartiles? Some of the statistics remind me what these would be. Zero, like, is this the absolute min? And then this is 25, 50, 75, oh. and max and 100? Probably. Yeah, yeah, probably. Okay. So, it, there's definitely a lot. It's funny. There's a lot of zero ones here. Uh, 75 is around a. Uh, a million. Yeah, so well, um, we can also uh, do a few plots. Yeah, so what do we, um, we have about, we don't have much time left. Maybe we should do one plot and we can look at this like a histogram or something like that. That'd be good. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, so we'll use, I included this vi uh, visualization library and this has some things that can help us uh, do this um, uh, um, let's see so we'll take the clean data set oops, and we will um, uh, let's select we'll select a column this is like select rows except now we're talking about columns and you can do this pretty easily just by uh, having a, a vector there and you say um, what column you're interested in. We'll say sale price. And then we want to do, uh, now we'll get into the plotting part. So the, the you know, the part here about now we're moving away from tablecloth, right? But these libraries are designed to work together. So viz like tablecloth expects the data um, expects the data, you know, in a pipe context. It's designed to work with the pipe as well, or the thread. Um, so what we do here is we say, okay, now we're gonna come, we're gonna take this data and we're gonna turn it into viz data, um, and then um, we will uh, let's see, um, we'll say what the x value is, uh, and the x value is. Um, Actually, no, let's not do it that way. Yeah, okay, we'll do it that way. Sale price. Um, and uh, then what, what What kind of chart we're gonna create. And we'll say type. And in this case, we specify it by this. Doing This is now kind of specific to, um, do, uh, to uh, the visualization library. And we'll say, give it like a bin count of 30. I don't know. That's going to be helpful. Uh, and then, then we say the last step is viz, viz. Um, so let's see if this works. Yeah, OK. So <laughs> um, things are really skewed by our zeros that, um, and our incredibly large value, <laughs> um, clearly. Uh, Let's see if we can. Let's let I don't know. Creating like this happens if we do like a higher bin count. Yeah. Okay. So something's really going on at that. Uh, Wolf ends. Um, so what we can do is um, let's see. Uh, we can drop. Yeah. I think we can drop values. Uh, let's say let's drop all the zeros. And we can go back up here and do that. Um, We'll do it after our, oops. Um, say drop, um, drop rows. And then to express that, we'll do another function. We'll say, okay, if the value is zero, um, and then we're grabbing the sale price. So this is another thing where we're saying, okay, first get the sale price column and then run the value through this function and check to see if it equals zero. And then, then since it's drop rows, we'll drop those rows. So that, and then let's see if that helps down here. Um, didn't seem to work. Oh, I didn't run the clean again. Um, there. No. 
uh, possibly, I'm not sure, but I don't know what happens if we compare an integer zero to oh. floating point. So yeah. maybe we could ask them to be like greater than at least five dollars or some. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I didn't do this. One. Yeah, actually, what we could do is like just you know, it's a little bit inefficient, but oh, right here. Is this the right expression? I always get these. I, this is I have a tr trouble with the. Uh, okay. Oops. Um, this should be right now. Um, yeah, so you should uh, reverse it. You're right. Yeah. You're right. It was opposite. Oops. No, because we're dropping. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oops. Maybe it's just there's still a lot of it's just, it could be that the zeros are gone, but it's the, just the high values. So let's try that. So let's let's try to just I don't know what was our percent our quartiles were. I don't know. It's just I don't know. Let's just say like uh, four hundred. I don't know four million or something. So we'll just to kind of get out the extremes. Um, uh, so we will do select rows. Um, um, whoops. Uh, and say, I don't know. Um, greater than, let's see, 400, 4 million. No price. If that helps. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> So uh, yeah, so we, I don't know, still having this, oh, maybe it's actually, maybe if we do, maybe there's just some like large, where did we do the cleaning? Let's say, let's, say, let's make this even like 1,000. Yeah, that's a little better. Yeah, so we have, uh, there's something going on at 1 million. <laughs> Uh, but it looks like, you know, where are we here? Around 640,000 is one peak. Um, um, anyway, yeah, so this is, uh, there's, you know, obviously more questions we could ask of this data set, but um, I picked this data set because it had, you know, it was sort of in good shape, but had some minor things that were weird about it. And so I think it shows, it's a good, um, way to just show what it's like to to you know to do data processing with tablecloth um and tablecloth is um is this workhorse that is meant to be easy to use for cleaning data which you know by that commonly repeated you know you know statement that you know 80 percent of data science is uh um <laughs> is data you know cleaning and manipulating uh you know it, it's um the goal of tablecloth is to make that sort of easy and i think um you know kind of see from this short exploration what what that means and what and, and why it is kind of easy uh, and and i think a lot of it is that readability of, that's uh, possible because you can use the threading macro uh and because the functions are you know um pretty clear, pretty straightforward. And, um, you know, you can pr provide these predicates. So it allows you to fully, um, you know, uh, provide uh, some sort of argument about what you what you're looking for, and you're filtering or whatever, in any, you know, using the full power of closures, expressivity around that kind of stuff with map and reduce and that kind of stuff. Um, are there any other questions at this point? I think we're at the end time and we could keep going a bit, um, uh, but uh, are there any questions right now just before we wrap up? Uh, so, 
and I imagine there's a, a capability to export this, um, your cleaned up data set. Yes. So I can show you that really quickly. So it's just write CSV. Um, and then you give, you know, a name. Uh, and oh, fantastic. I'm not sure why that didn't work. But what did it say? Wrong number of arguments. Oh, oh, I didn't actually provide the data. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's written, uh, and you could read it and see. Did it work? No. Oh. Oh, right. It was um, not thinking. Yeah. So you, yeah, pretty, has all those basic um, in out, you know, function, you know, things. Uh, and I think you can also write in other formats too, which is why there's a, you write um, output path options. I'm not sure. Let's see. So there's another way you can look at things by looking right in the data. Um, I guess you can, yeah. I haven't tried this personally, but that's something we could explore in a future session when we look at some of these other data formats. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, it, it's fully, tablecloth is, is very wonderful to use and it's kind of fully functional in the sense that, um, it, especially in terms of manipulate, you know, thing, you know, basic manipulate, filtering, subsetting, accessing, mapping over columns and things like that. Uh, and, and then the one part where there's a little bit uh, a, a rough area still is what we need to, you kind of need to dump, jump down into uh, tech data type when you do certain operations on, on uh, things. And that's something that may very well change. Some of the work I'm doing right now is to bring some of those operations uh, in tech data type up into tablecloth uh, so that they're available for operating on columns without having to kind of step outside of the tablecloth world. Well, uh, the tablecloth manual does not look as intimidating as a pandas does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's some parts of it um, uh, are, are fairly intuitive. Um, I think the naming, yeah, the naming of the, uh, yeah, to me, it's the piping, the, the threading and the, you know, and the, and the naming uh, just makes it really easy to have pretty you know, do complicated things pretty concisely. Um, any other great. questions? Yeah, that, that was fantastic that you were able to do this with a beginning to end full workflow live. <laughs> That's yeah. always an achievement. Yeah, I, I I wasn't sure how how far we'd get. I mean, obviously, there's way more, so many more interesting questions we could ask of the data set. Um, but then, the, yeah, one thing I was hoping to do at some point, uh, but it would be is I think you know, also tablecloth has a a whole bunch of uh, facilities for joining. So it 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 does make it also easy to uh, you know relatively to to bring data together, although that's always a more complicated <laughs> uh, prospect. Um, and I can and I can't recommend the the docs enough, you know, in terms of just um, giving you a pretty clear sense of what what there is and also different ways of using it. Yeah. So, and just to, it's sometimes confusing uh, if you're looking in the repository, um, the, uh, I always trouble, let's make this big. So the documentation is over here on this link. So that's, uh, sometimes I have trouble finding that. Maybe at some point we'll change that to make it a bit more prominent. Um, 
It's also here. So under, yeah, that's fairly prominent. Documentation, detailed documentation with examples. That's that, what I've been showing you. So if you click that, you get this page. All right, I think uh, if there aren't more questions, that does it for the primary session. And we could uh, stick around and do more if people want.